We ask the question, what is needed in the world? Social unrest these days is part of the fabric of South African life. The promise of what was once called the Rainbow Nation still to be realized. A different and perhaps more ominous chapter has opened. There's widespread public discontent with what is perceived as endemic corruption and deep disappointment, if not anger, at the gross inequality that is still so much part of the society. How did it come to this? Africa. What happened to the democracy that Nelson Mandela and other great leaders ushered in? These are questions we put to South African writer Nadine Gordimer, who for decades has provided a mirror in which the people of South Africa could view themselves. Since publishing her first story over 60 years ago, Gordimer has produced dozens of novels, essays and plays. Her work a meander through love and politics in her native land. The characters drawn from those around her, their voices that rang loudly through decades of apartheid, continue to sound the years since the end of the white regime. She was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1991. Her magnificent epic writing, said the citation, has been of very great benefit to humanity. She became a member of the African National Congress at a time when the movement was outlawed, and though many of her works were banned, she never stopped writing. Never soften the voices of those entangled in the racist maze that was the system of apartheid. And in the years since the ANC came to power, she subjected the new rulers to the same honest and rigorous scrutiny she applied to the white government they replaced. She continues to probe to reveal truths that many would rather remain hidden. And above all, Nadine Gordimer continues to reject censorship of ideas in any form, her mantra unchanged through decades, that a people can only be free if they are free to say what they want. Nadine Gordimer, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. To begin, 18 years ago, this was the Rainbow Nation. It was a shining beacon to yes. a people who courageously fought for non-racial democracy. Is, has that rainbow shattered, or was it never really No, there? I don't think it shattered because, you know, rainbows, the light changes, they go out and then they come back again. But um, a lot of things have to happen, a lot of um, good rain, not just the ordinary kind, but the, the, the rain of good sense and of determination and courage um, has to come before the rainbow comes back. What happened? What happened in these years? Well, you know, everybody has their own theories about it and you find that you yourself, your ideas are changing or developing all the time. I think one of the key things is that during the time of the struggle, those of us who were in the struggle at the very height of it or were playing a humble part in it, um, we were totally concentrating on getting rid of apartheid, of defeating the regime. And we didn't have the time, or let's be a bit hard on ourselves, the good sense, to sit down and think about what might happen afterwards, what we might have to, to face. There's only one thing you, we couldn't have been expected to, to face, but I'll just mention it in, in, in passing, though it's more than that in terms of what's happening here. We didn't know that our neighbours would be in conflict and that we'd have this enormous, I think we put something like three million, the conservative changing figure of refugees coming and swelling our enormous unemployment problem. And yet that was a natural consequence of a developing society, was it not? Well, no, that we couldn't foresee. But let's set that aside and excuse ourselves if we couldn't have thought of that. But of course, what has been astonishing that I suppose in our trust, in ourselves and others, was the extent of corruption, the mater wild materialism, the greed. I perfectly understand, I have many good friends, comrades who indeed had such a hard time. So all this is in the DNA of the majority of people, of the indigenous black majority in, in, um, in, in South Africa. Um, 
So if somebody now, who indeed fought so bravely and could have died and spent years on the island or in other prisons, um, if they come now to our post-apartheid, our free South Africa, naturally you expect to have a decent life and a comfortable living and certain privileges indeed um, that would come automatically with that. That I understand perfectly. You've never had a decent house, you know. You've never owned a car, perhaps some old jalopy. All these things, um, of course, and on top of everything else, you've never walked around freely. You've never got into the same queue at the bank. All these things, perhaps, we have to look at now that we didn't think of. But why has there been this tremendous disillusion for the population here, for us, that materialism has gone wild, that our, some of our heroes from Nkwonto, some of our heroes who were in exile, some of our heroes who have taken, risked their lives and they've given their time, the years of their youth, to, uh, to the struggle. Why they are now falling into corruption? Why they cannot compensate sufficiently? As I say, my only explanation is it's in the DNA. The whites have had it since the 17th century. Now we can never make up for that. So it's another Mercedes, it's another mansion to be built, and so on. But this is very sad because these are, these are wonderful people, the best that any human society could produce. So to see them really betray themselves, never mind the rest of us, is very, is very, very disturbing. Is it too trite to say that power corrupts? Well, of course, you know, that's the old adage. And it seems true. But for instance, it didn't corrupt Mandela. Why? We've seen events at Marikana at a platinum mine in which workers have gone on strike asking for an increase in wages. Yet it appears to be more than just that. It seems to be more than a labour dispute. The, the country's focus has gone on this and is looking at all sorts of little faults and fractures in the society which appear to be magnified. People living in unbelievable squalor while indeed um, servicing the rest of us by digging up the gold or the platinum or the uranium or whatever it is. Where does the accountability lie though? The government says it's a mining company that's responsible but surely Government has a duty to look after its Well, exactly. People. Certainly the mining company is responsible. But the government is responsible to see that the mining com company deals justly with its workers. And now it's very interesting to me to see that the, the, the trade unions, that um, Kosatu, um, indeed in many cases is no longer trusted by the, uh, by the workers. I haven't read whether this is true or not, but I can see there, again, corruption. Something with a large sum to put in your fat pocket and you will not indeed proceed any further with um, challenging the mining companies. But I think the mining companies and the government, they have to get together. The mining companies must, have, must pay decent wages and provide decent accommodation for their workers. You mentioned there Kasatu, the Congress of South African Trade Unions. Now, that was an organization that was at the forefront of the struggle, an absolutely crucial ally of the African National Congress. And yet here we see this disillusion among the workers, many of the workers, with this umbrella body that was so important to the country's past. Have we forgotten where we came from or has the unions itself changed? Has, has, has these these forces changed in these years of democracy. Well, who is we? We ordinary citizens, we can't monitor the trade unions. There again, this is the Department of Labour. But again, we come up again, what has become oh, so disillusioningly, the, the culture of corruption in our country. I know it's all over the world to a certain extent, but you naturally concentrate upon where you live and, and the people among whom you live and who, who, to whom you belong. And here, considering our past and considering the remarkable success of the struggle against tremendous odds, it is 
almost unbelievable that we should indeed be corrupt, that we should be destroying ourselves with corruption now. Throughout the body of your work, there's, 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 there's been a real fight for the individual. There's always been that sensibility of, of, of each and every person. And it never appeared to me that you were ever a joiner as such. You didn't seem to like groups, certainly through your work, yet you joined the ANC. You joined the African National Congress at a time that was banned. Yes, Why? yes. It's difficult to explain. And there I must thank my heavily involved friends in the African National Congress and in other uh, organisations against uh, who, who fought in the, in the struggle against apartheid, that they didn't expect me to write propaganda. They simply accepted that a writer um, who is by nature a writer must go deeper and look from many different angles, even uh, doubting the judgments and feelings of him or herself. Because writing for me, and this is what I see in the writers that I admire, it's um, a journey of discovery. Through our art, through, through the word, we are looking into the real meaning of human life. Politics encloses this, but within that, we are still individual human beings, and that is really how I've approached my, my work. You mentioned there the issue of censorship. Um, oh, as yes. you said, a number of your books were banned the, under the um, old regime, and yet, are we not seeing censorship still today? We still have a public debate about what can be said or what cannot be done. You cannot do this cartoon of the president. Oh, indeed, you are. This, this is something that uh, here again one moves from one's life as a writer into political action. And I have been now for more than for two years or more, ever since it started, campaigning with others, Andre Brink and um, other writers here and abroad, uh, against this protection of state information bill. This is censorship with another name. It's a euphemism for absolutely putting a hand over f freedom of expression. And of course, we see it, we've seen it uh, most obviously when it comes to the cartoons we've seen. But it will go much further than that. When you think that if it stands as it is now, if you are in some government department where something very doubtful and shady is going on. I know you and I'm a journalist and you tell me something and it's just like that. I'm, and this is how journalists work all the time and this is what the newspapers and the other um, media are for, to see what is really going on behind the smoke screens. I then write an article and I get called into court under the Protection of State Information Bill. The first thing I get asked is, where did you get the information from? And I have to reveal that it came from you, and then you too are indeed arraigned as probably guilty of this, and you too will come to court and can serve a sentence. So this is an iniquitous bill. It is a very frightening bill. Why is the state so fearful? Because is it's our corrupt. democracy that vulnerable? No, my dear, it's because there are so many corrupt people, unfortunately, high up. Do you feel betrayed in a way? Do you feel betrayed by that kind of corruption, by a government that some argue has so many venal people within it? Well, you know, one's a, just a, a cipher, just one person. So it's not for me to say I'm betrayed. I feel as part of the people of South Africa, all colors, all kinds, that we are betrayed. This is what really troubles me. And wherever you look, you know, you can ask me 24 other questions. Look what's happening in our hospitals. They are worse than they were during the apartheid time. But you have, I think three, three or four days ago, a doctor doing a caesarean operation with a bit with torchlight. I want to just go back in and take a, 
a look at when the you received the Nobel Peace Prize in ninety one. No, no. Uh, the, sorry, when you when you, you received of course the Nobel Prize for Literature. Yes. And the um, committee cited, and this, and this is what the citation said, is that above all, it is people, individual men and women, that captured her and have been captured by her. It is their lives, their heaven and hell, that absorbs her. The outer reality is ever present, but it is through her characters that the whole historical process is crystallized. Is that an accurate description of your work, do you believe? Well, you know, everybody sees the work uh, differently. And that's an, uh, an interesting and view of it. I, I wouldn't fault it. But everybody, including myself, sees it. Even my individual books I see in, uh, in different ways. I might like to say here, uh, talking of people who've influenced my thought in this way, I have been um, several times to Egypt. Egypt was the first country I ever went to at the age of 29 from uh, South Africa, where uh, my husband, Ronald Cassera, who was um, in, the, in, in British intelligence during the war in Cairo, and he took me there. And then I, we, I went again several times and was invited for various writers' occasions, and I had the greatest admiration for Naguib Mahfouz, one of the great world writers, really. And we often talked about these things. The first time I went to Egypt, it was indeed when uh, Farouk was deposed. And uh, when I re keep my great interest in Egypt now, things that are going on there now are extremely worrying. So we seem to be going through a peculiar phase of uh, confusion about what it means to be a human being and how indeed to bring this about in our separate societies where indeed it is being threatened. Well, I refer to your latest book, No, no Time Like the Present. Um, just briefly, it's a story of, of a couple who met while in exile with the ANC, returned to a democratic country and get increasingly alienated by a society, societies which is not what they imagined it would be. But what I found interesting in it is, is, is a, there's almost an anger ringing out in those pages. Certainly a sense of frustration. Did you feel that when well, you were I writing I think it's it? double for them. Because first of all, they were in the struggle together. But you haven't mentioned that she's black and he's white. So for him to be in the struggle is something unusual. We had wonderful people heaven knows. We had the, uh, uh, the Slovos, we had, we've had uh, Bears and Odea, many people, I'm only mentioning a couple of names, you know, um, on the tip of my tongue. But they have then this experience, which turns out to be almost a false one, when you come into what should be a normal society. They were together, didn't matter what colour, and they even married in, in, uh, in Swaziland. She comes from a really um, set tribal background. I mean, the very title of the story comes from her father mouthing out from his old uh, textbook reading, no time like the present, get on with it, do it now. Mm. So the, the title, of course, has a double meaning for me. I always have my titles before I write the book, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yes, you? yes. Um, so in that book, there's that background. But once they're in a so-called normal post-apartheid time, there are all the other um, social and political problems that come in, that were put aside, so to speak, while they were all well, fighting together in the struggle. And of course, on a very personal level, I think that people who, individuals who marry across different backgrounds, never mind colour, even a different language background, different country background. There are always quite interesting things for each to discover about the other, to learn from, and also sometimes to be slightly shocked by. I mean, there, um, Gabu, she has this very warm relationship with her father, and she's a bit shocked by the fact that, that Steve is completely, he, he has outgrown his family background, and she's the one who's got, who has to say, look, we should go and see them. 
So these are the things that interest me as a writer, not just these are the part of the big problems that human beings have to, to meet with each other. Underneath, they have indeed these small differences if they come from different cultures. And yet um, they come back to a South Africa that was supposed to be the polyglot, which was the non-racial society. It was supposed to be all hmm. of that. But it wasn't and isn't. It wasn't and isn't. And that's what we have to, to deal with. At, at, at the end of the novel, you, you, there's almost a howl of the word Ubuntu, a word that means humanity in its widest possible sense. I'm you and you are me, <clears throat> yes. It seems as though you're trying to wave that like a flag. It's, it's like a, a cure. No, no. If you, if you remember the end of the, of the novel, uh, they are about to leave for Australia, the plane for Perth. As many of some of them have been shocked sometimes of the people we know who have gone. And then he, the last words in the book, he, he says, I'm not going. I wonder what he's thinking now. Is he thinking now, oh my God, I should have gone, but I should still go. So this is for the reader to ponder on. For me, um, a novel is open-ended in this way. When I finish somebody's novel, uh, a writer whose work means a lot to me, then I realise now it's up to me to go on from there. Incidentally, in this context, if I may, I'd like to mention a wonderful novel, um, indeed, by um, Mongani Wali Soroti, which is called um, Scatter the Ashes and Go. Many people who were in the struggle have written sort of autobiographical pieces um, or supposedly novels based on this, which all emphasise, and one can understand it, the heart, the difficulty, the, the heroism, to use that big word that was there. But Soroti is the only one who's shown how, because we are human beings, even people living in a tent in the desert or in the bush who might not see the next day, might be shot there. They have the ordinary human tensions as well. This one has an irritating habit. Um, uh, that one um, indeed talks too much and should shut up and doesn't. And then in the occasional uh, facility, shall we say, of women around, there's tremendous jealousy that this man was favoured and that one was not in these passing little um, nights of joy. It's a really remarkable book, so I always like to talk about it and get people to read it. Scatter the ashes and go. Do you think that um, great writers like that, writers like yourself, writers who reflect aspects of our past that in some ways were heroic, are they still remembered? In, the, in this new society, is, is the past still with the people here, or is it ignored or denied? Well, when it is with the people, it is, it is with us in a negative way. But you cannot shed, shed the past. The past is in your DNA hmm? from way back, and you simply have to use it to remember it and to see to get some guidance from where it went wrong and why and what there is in human beings. I mean, we are very strange creatures. And we have to deal with ourselves in order to be able to deal with these problems. I personally, um, uh, some people of course have faith and have the, the, the staff of um, a religion. Uh, whether it is Christianity, whether it's Judaism, whether they are Muslims, whether they are Hindus. Um, and they, of course, believe that there is somebody who indeed is watching over them. Um, but I, d I don't have this. I'm an atheist, and I believe with the poet W.B. Yeats, what do we know but in this place we meet one another face to face? Nadine Gordimer, 
Thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much.